Hello. Hey, okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Josh. Um, I am a developer working at Carry, and I'm here with uh, my colleague, Greg, who is also a developer working on Carry. Um, so today, I wanted to give a brief introduction into a project we've been working on named Carry. Um, so I'll give you the agenda. Oops. There you go. So the agenda is, uh, I'll give, gonna give a brief introduction to what Carry is and why we're building it. Um, and then talk a little bit about the project goals and the roadmap, uh, give a brief demo. Um, and then Greg is gonna give a bit of a talk of the architecture overview and the technical details of the project. And then we're gonna give a little bit of a talk on some of the projects that other projects have been working in the ecosystem who are working on similar projects. So what is Carry? Um, Carry is a, a Maori name of origination from New Zealand. It means uh, Lord of the Forest, and it's one of the oldest and largest trees on the planet. So essentially, what we are sorry, <laughs> essentially what we are trying to build is a decentralized technical knowledge and support network for the Ethereum ecosystem. And what that really means is it's a platform where developers come to share knowledge, um, so that you know share knowledge and expertise um, so that everyone can learn from each other. So you can build an ecosystem around a specific uh, library or a specific topic within the Ethereum ecosystem, and everybody can come in there, share and learn knowledge and learn, and everyone can benefit. So why are we building Carry? Well, there's three main reasons, and I'm gonna go into them in a little bit more detail, but we have an exponentially growing developer community. So it's growing really fast. Um, developer teams can become stretched because of this, and open source support models are a little bit broken. Uh, that's my why in a sec. So, just some graphics to show you. Um, so, the, the Ethereum developer ecosystem is growing at a rapid rate. Not only, so you can see um, in February we had around 50,000 truffle downloads a month, um, and I believe I can't see the chart there, but as you can see, it's a very, very large increase in new Ethereum addresses being created. So that really showing is that not only is there many, many developers joining the ecosystem, but also many, many DAP users as well. So, um, so I guess with any kind of open source technology, they follow a specific kind of timeline. And so we kind of started with Ethereum with Vitalik and a group of other guys creating this wonderful idea open sourcing it, giving it to the world. And then developers started becoming engaged and that's where we're at now. We have a lot of developer engagement, a lot of um, uh, new dApps being developed, a lot of new tools being developed for the ecosystem. Um, and then the problem that you have is that when you have new developers coming into this ecosystem, there's a lack of accessible documentation, there's a lack of accessible technical support and services. And you kind of need to build those before you can start to build real production grade pro uh, products. Obviously as well, you need to solve problems of scaling um, on the Kiosk system as well, but you, you need these services as well. So Carry, we're really focused on providing accessible documentation and technical support and services. So building for a support function can be costly for early stage startup. So, if you can imagine if you're working in the MetaMask team and they're doing a wonderful job, they have uh, over one million users right now. Um, but a small, a core, small set of developers um, gonna have to spend a lot of time fixing issues, fixing bugs, and generally uh, spend a lot of money um, to, uh, sorry, spend a lot of money to uh, build a support team and that can then take develop, core developers' focus away from actually pushing new features. Um, and then you have just, just a kind of map of some of the other um, core tools and uh, that have been used in this ecosystem. So you have like infrastructure products like IPFS and Infura. You have dev tools like Truffle, Ganache, Netferium, um, libraries like OpenZeppelin, Web3.js, ETHJS, and all that kind of stuff. And then you have like core components for dApps, like MetaMask, Uport, uh, ZeroRex as like a dApp protocol, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these kind of 
protocols and libraries and tools are what developers are using. And as you can see, within just within this ecosystem, um, there is a large amount of stuff, new things coming out. Um, and also what happens is, because this is a very new technology, um, documentation and best practices and tutorials that you maybe saw six months ago could be completely invalidated. So one of kind of example I had when I was first getting into um, developing smart contracts, I went online, I found this great tutorial in how to, I think it was like a voting contract. So I downloaded it, tried to compile it, and uh, it didn't work. And so that could be very frustrating to somebody who's trying to learn and get into this ecosystem. Um, yeah. So open source support models are a little bit broken. So core contributors are expected to support their projects for free, which is, yes, open source, of course, it's great. Um, and paid support models are available for teams who can afford it. So sometimes, I guess, uh, you can have a separate organization, which is a for profit organization, which takes an open source piece of code and then start selling support services on top of that. Uh, kind of the issue there I see is, you know, there's this group of developers who've created this really great product, but then someone else is monetizing it. It's not always bad because they provide a service, but the kind of the benefits are a little bit out of whack there. And the other issue is that if you have small and medium-sized startups, they may not be able to afford uh, to pay for these support services. So you kind of need a hybrid in between where you can pay for support as and when you need it. Some marketplaces exist for that, but they're not really that great at the moment. So how does Carry help with these, two, uh, with these issues? So first of all, we want to incentivize curation of technical knowledge. And now what that basically means is that developers can gain access to quality documentation um, if we can all crowd, uh, crowdsource knowledge around a specific project. So with Carry, with the example of uh, MetaMask, what we do is we have a MetaMask topic on Carry. Um, anybody can submit documentation can submit tutorials, can submit best practices, and then the MetaMask development team or community are there to act as the safeguard, the quality assurance, before that documentation or best practice gets uploaded into the carry, um, into the MetaMask area on carry. Um, and then kind of later on down the line, one of the things we're hoping to be able to bring to the ecosystem is an open support network and marketplace. And basically what that means is, um, if you can imagine if you're a developer or you're a contributor in the carry network, you are gaining some sort of reputation and expertise and demonstrating expertise within a specific domain. Um, so you kind of have a reputation. And so therefore, you can then start to provide one-on-one -on -one support to other developers within that network. So why this is really might be really interesting is if you have a, um, a library which you are maintaining, um, or a project that you're working on, and you don't have the funds to um, hire support staff, you can leverage your community of contributors and community of developers who have been contributing to your project, and those developers can start to offer support if they wanted to. Uh, so a, kind of a brief overview of what Carry looks like or will look like. It is a network where we provide a platform for knowledge, uh, Q&A, so Q&A is like Stack Overflow, and uh, support, so P2P support where somebody can be an expert and provide support in that network. Uh, so developers come to learn. Um, they can incentivize the creation of knowledge if they want to, they don't have to, so I can post a request for free and say I, I need documentation on how to uh, what can I say? Good example. So I want a, I want a piece of documentation or tutorial which shows me how to integrate the Ledger Nano S hardware wallet as an authentic authentication model into my DAP, for instance. So there's probably a tutorial already exists, but that's just an example. If it didn't exist, someone could create that request. Um, they could post that on Cowry. Somebody else can see that request and provide a tutorial. Uh, long form content uh, format really. So we're looking at um, code examples plus written content plus videos. Um, and 
So they can post that for free, or they can incentivize someone to do that by posting, attaching some sort of bounty to that request. Um, then you have community. Um, the community members in the carrier network can submit a tutorial or can submit that content, and the project owners can then verify that content is correct. And once that happens, then it goes into the carrier network. Uh, and then the kind of other uh, side effect of this, which is important, is that projects can actually build up their community engagement with this model. So carry goals and roadmap. So this is a kind of like a reflection of what I've just said already. Uh, so we, our goal is to be community owned. So you want the, a project to support the open source community. We don't want to own any of the data. And uh, Greg will talk a little bit about how we do that. Uh, we want to curate quality knowledge through documentation and tutorials and best practices around ecosystem projects to help new developers. Uh, we want to decrease the time to execute for developers by collaborating and sharing knowledge. Um, and we, one of the other things is that we want to decrease the cost and time to support open source projects and obviously be rewarding for the contributors. So a little bit of our roadmap. Uh, so we are launching a closed beta MVP in the middle of April. Uh, stay tuned for that. There will be some ecosystem projects and libraries we'll be working with. And we will launch that on the Rink B testnet um, in April. And then Q4, we will hopefully be moving to the mainnet with that. Uh, so in between that time, we have to do uh, some security audits on our smart contracts. And then we have a, uh, a few new features that we want to push as well. So um, at the moment, the MVP will be to request a piece of uh, uh, content. Um, and then a, a single submitter will submit that content, and then it will be owned by that single submitter and uh, verified by uh, a project owner. Um, one of the issues is with that is when we get into the stage where uh, a piece of an article can exist now, and it becomes out of date because maybe the, the library moved on and the best practice has now changed, or maybe the best way to do something has, has changed, uh, then somebody else can come and edit that article, and then you have two people who have collaborated on that document. And one of the problems that we haven't solved at the moment that we're working on is having multi-ownership uh, of a document and how we kind of distribute the funds if more than one person has created an article, et cetera. Um, and then we have the uh, issue around, like, you don't want to always have to submit a transaction, so we're working on being able to um, start with a request being off-chain, so if you don't want uh, to attach a bounty to it, there's no reason for you to, to submit a transaction. Um, but what can happen later on is how do you then move that request to an on-chain state when somebody else may see that request and say, I actually want to fund that because maybe I'm interested in that more interested in the person who, who raised it. Um, in the future, um, we have like a notion at the moment of like project owners acting as the gatekeepers and like quality managers of, of, of content in the area. And we kind of want to move away from that in the long term uh, just because it's a, a centralization point. So I mean, when you're creating a bounty and uh, maybe someone from the MetaMask team sees that, not that they would do anything nefarious, but they could just request uh, reject someone's request even though it was of sufficient quality. So you don't want to have that centralization point. So further down that, one of the things that we're doing some research here with at the moment is how we have community, um, community curated topic channels. So the kind of idea there is that anybody can come into Carry Network and create a topic channel. Say, I want to create a topic around uh, state channels, for instance. And then I will then say that these is, this is the criteria to be a community member in the state channels uh, community. So, these, this, uh, so anybody can then join that community and be a member of that community who curates the documents that go into that channel. Uh, the other thing that we're working on is contributor reputation, because contributor reputation is going to be essential to um, a P2P technical support market. So how do you then know 
that somebody is truly an expert in a specific field. Uh, so then we're working on that as well. And then I'm going to give a little bit of a demo of what we have already. So this is um, how what carry looks like when you're browsing uh, for an article. Uh, yeah. So we have uh, a few topics on there at the moment. So we have the MetaMask topic, we have a general Ethereum topic and a Uport topic. And if I wanted to learn about smart contracts, I could find a article about smart contracts. And it looks something like this at the moment. So this is just a demo, uh, some dummy data. Um, And if I was to make a request for an article, it would look something like this. So, sorry. So I create a request. Uh, I choose a topic that I want to submit that request for. I give it a title. And then we have something here. So I can set a deadline if I need this in two weeks. I can add some ether to it as a bounty. What's happening here is that you've had like two transactions. Whoops, my bad. Let me go back. There were two transactions there. One, one, one of the first transaction is signing the content because what we actually do is we store the content in IPFS, and so in order for that content to have an owner, it needs a signatory, and we 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 store that signature. Um, with the content in IPFS so that we know who owns that article. Um, and then the transaction there is to send the second signatory there in MetaMask is to actually submit the transaction with the bounty to the Ethereum network, which so the bounty will be held in smart contract. And then creating some content for that request. So I can browse, come in, I can browse which requests are in the network at the moment. Um, I can create an article. Ah, so I'll explain that really, whoops. Bad. Sorry about that. I'll explain that really quickly. So uh, let's see if I can pause that at the right point. Not really. Okay. <laughs> Let's go back. Okay. So I'll explain it really quickly. So what happened there was I, the, I we clicked on, on I'm on it, and that is a feature which was added to so that you can lock a request if there's a, a bounty attached to it. So, for instance, um, let's say there is a large bounty attached to a request, and I think I could contribute to that, but it's going to take me two weeks. And you know, I don't want to waste two weeks of my time uh, working on this. And then the, 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 you know, the, the person who submitted the request just changed the requirements underneath me. So I can actually just lock that and say, I'm working on it. And what that means then is that any change to the, to the request has to be agreed by both the anyone who's locked it and, and the requester. Um, yeah. And then the other thing to explain there is that then when the request is submitted, then that goes into the approval phase where the topic owners or moderators, so if it was MetaMask, then it will be the MetaMask team, would then take a look at the article. They'll be able to comment, make comments, and come to agreement on to like, uh, you know, when the article is ready to be submitted. And then when, once they approve it, then they can send the transaction to the smart contract, the bounty will be released to the uh, contributor. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Greg, who's going to talk a little bit about the architecture of the system. Hi, everyone. So, my name is Greg, and I'm back in developer at Curry. So I'm going to talk about the technical side of Curry, uh, what choices we made in terms of architecture and software design. S oops, sorry. Yeah. 
So first of all, at Curry, we don't want to own or store your content, but you, we want to provide, as Josh mentioned, a decentralized, trustless, and community-based platform to share and learn knowledge. So to do that, we separated the platform into two layers. So first of all, uh, protocol layers uh, which is a collection of decentralized technologies which guarantee openness and transparency to, to deliver all core functions. And on top of that, an application layer, which is a, a traditional application, uh, which provides uh, extra features to improve the user, user, user experience, the UX. So let's talk about the protocol layer. So we designed it in a way that anybody could build uh, another query application on top of it. So it's very easy to use and it's just like an open by default API. So for that, we use uh, some decentralized technology we think are secure and very powerful, like uh, a strong blockchain and smart contracts for all the trustless and the, uh, trustless interaction and payment. And IPFS as a um, uh, distributed storage for the content distribution. So to summarize a little bit our core features, so we've got uh, the content ownership, so using digital signatures, the security of existence with IPFS, and in terms of smart contracts, we're using uh, for the payment, so we're doing Bounty and tips, we're doing the content approval, uh, we, having, we, we got a registry of requests and article, and as Josh mentioned in the roadmap, we want to investigate and do some research on reputation and curation market. So the application layer. So uh, decentralization is very exciting, very important, but at the same time, it's, it's kind of hard because all the technologies are very young and it can be complicated to build a, a real user experience for for any kind of uh, developer in our case. So that's why we build this uh, traditional application on top of it, which is connected to the, connected to the decentralized protocol using uh, libraries, web free libraries like Web3.js uh, or Web3.j. Uh, it's a microservices architecture. And um, so it provides at the end a practical and cost-effective user experience. So all features in terms of the application, so we've got the, all the notification through WebSocket or emails, the ability to vote or comment any content, search capabilities, uh, mostly like full text search or query search on uh, IPFS, and the ability to monitor the whole, uh, the whole system. So the stack looks like that. So it's, uh, it's not that complicated. So we go through each layer. So on top, we have the front end, which is using uh, React. It's interacting with a blockchain with MetaMask and WebRedJS. It's also interacting with a GraphQL API, which is developed in Java with Spring Boot. Uh, we also have an authentication module. It's a passwordless, passwordless authentication module. So basically, the way it works, the end user sign a piece of data, which is share with the authentication module. Uh, he sent his public key, the signature, and using elliptic curve cryptography, we can check if, uh, if the public key match and send a GWT token back. So we can authenticate all the GraphQL uh, call. So underneath that, so we using, so because of the asynchronous nature of the blockchain, we're using Kafka as a messaging bus. So that way we can queue all the events coming both from the blockchain and from the API gateway. Below that, we have some other uh, Java Spring Boot services. So on the left-hand side, we have something we call the broadcaster. So it's basically a smart contract event listener, which listens for, for events and trigger a message on Kafka. On the right hand side, we have an email service which sends uh, email notification to the end user. And in the middle, we have a, a core service which manages all the business logic and something we call the reconciliation, 
uh, between smart contracts event and API events. And finally, at the bottom, so we have the database layer, which is storing JSON document on IPFS, and we're using uh, Elasticsearch to index uh, some of the content and provide some uh, full text search capabilities. And everything is deployed using Kubernetes. So just to finish, uh, some other aspect of the decentralization. Uh, so we really, re we really believe into open sourcing. So we start open to open source uh, part of our stack. So the IPFS store, the database layer, is already uh, available on GitHub. So feel free to check out, contribute if you want to. The broadcaster, which is an event listener, is coming soon. And as Josh mentioned, we're going to do some research on peer-to-peer -peer community reputation and uh, curation market. So if you want to uh, help us on that, please just reach us. So that's it for the technical part, and I will let Josh finish with the partners. Cool. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, so a brief word on some other projects who are working on similar things and some projects who are we are working with. Uh, so to so do bounties, we are working with the bounties network team. Um, so Bounties Network is an open protocol for bounties for any task paid in any token on Ethereum. Um, they don't take any network fees. Um, and th the main goal there is to standardize how bounties are done on the Ethereum network. So many projects are going to be using bounties and some sort of have some sort of bounty smart contract. And the aim there is to have a standardized process of how that is done. Um, and uh, they are helping us or other projects like us uh, to incentivize users to perform tasks, basically. Uh, they're currently spinning up new verticals, so carry will lack a vertical on the bounties network, and they're spinning up new verticals in mentorship, uh, social impact bounties, and graphic design bounties, etc. And uh, you can contact bounties team at contacts at bounties.network, and Mark Balin is leading that project. Really cool guy. Um, and then Gitcoin. So Gitcoin is very much kind of aligned with, <laughs> mission aligned with Gitcoin. Uh, so their project is also to push open source forward and support the open source development ecosystem. Uh, so they're building a community, community of open source contributors, similar to uh, what we're doing. Um, they're basically monetizing the incentivization of work, uh, open source code, code, code contributions on GitHub. Uh, so it kind of works like if you, you go to GitHub and there is a Gitcoin button at the top of any issue, and then you can click that button and create a bounty on that on top of that issue, and that again uses the bounties network to do that. Uh, and Kevin Awaki is an awesome developer uh, who's leading that, and then you can contact Kevin at founders at gitcoin.co. And this is kind of what the ecosystem looks like. So you have the standard bounties on Ethereum at the, at the bottom. Mark is also working on some other integrations like arbitration, um, uh, reputation systems, pricing, allocation, and we're doing some research with also in those areas. Um, and yeah, so Gitcoin is a vertical on top of the standards bounties network. So is Cowry, and you can have many, many different verticals on top of that. So if you're interested in working with bounties or if you want to help to standardize how bounties are done on Ethereum or if you're working with bounties already, please do get in contact with Mark um, because collaboration is important. And it's important that we standardize this across the whole Ethereum network. Um, if you want to incentivize code contributions to your open source project, then do check out Gitcoin. And of course, if you want to help build quality uh, knowledge contributions with your project, then get in touch with Carrie. Um, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any? Hi, thanks for the presentation. I was just wondering how are you gonna handle 
if uh, once you 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 make a request for some uh, content yeah. if there is someone that is going to be working on it how are you going to handle the possibility that uh, more than one person is going to be wanting to work on it yeah and uh, and then the other question the second question would be uh, you say that uh, if someone if i submit a request and then you want to work on it and i want to make some changes on it uh, we will have to consent on it uh, can I like uh, back out uh, a content request or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the way it works is, is and there's, so the, the first thing is about kind of like multi contributions. If you have multiple articles which meet the criteria, how do you kind of decide like which one is correct? Um, so in the first kind of version, um, the, the, the projects will just choose one which they think is which is correct, and that's just like, we're gonna push that down. But in the next version, um, so hopefully in Q4, we are f working on how we can, um, first of all, there's like two, there's two different things. So you have two different articles, um, maybe both of them answer the question. So when you move to a, a state where you do topic curation, then you can have multiple articles which solve the same question in, in, in the ecosystem. And anybody can choose to curate any article into their topic channel. So that kind of solves that kind of stage. But the, what that doesn't solve is if you have an article which has been merged or contributed by multiple participants. So if you have two um, articles which are submitted for one request, maybe you can take pieces from both and create an even better article, right? So if you have some sort of merge, then how do you decide on like if there's a bounty, like how much contribution was done by one and, and by the other, and that's uh, one thing we're working on. Hopefully for Q4. Um, the second question, sorry, I can't. Hello. Right. Uh, the second question was uh, regarding the fact that uh, we have to consent if I want to make a modification. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the way it works at the moment is is that you would have a set of deadline, and if no work is submitted that meets the criteria by that deadline, you can withdraw the bounty. Um, but there are some edge cases here. So like, for instance, I may lock the request so you can't change it, and I submit something that meets the criteria, but it's not what you want. So there was something here. Uh, So we have something here called arbitration. So arbitration is a is what we're going to use to solve this issue. So if there's an issue that can't be solved in the Caribbean network, we will use an, an arbitration mechanism. Um, we're working. So Mark Bailey, the Bounty Network, is working on that. We're doing some research on that. There is also uh, Clement, who's working on that with Clarus IO. And the idea then is that you would be able to pay an arbitration fee, maybe both parties would have to pay an arbitration fee, and then there will be a panel of experts, we need to figure out how that works, and they will adjudicate on that issue, and they will basically make the final decision on, like, you know, was you, was you right, was the person trolling you, um, are you just trying to back out of the request because you see someone's working on it, yeah, they'll, they'll figure that out, and then they'll make a decision, and then if it's a don't like decision, there's an appeal process, but it gets, so there's a lot of research that we have to do there, but that is something that we're looking at, into. Any questions? Cool. All right, thank you. <laughs>